There we go. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, mute everybody's lines centrally um, so that we don't get a lot of background noise. And um, lead has muted your line. Able to hear me still, um, but everyone else should be muted. Um, so, uh, uh, looks like it worked. And um, what we're going to have to do, unfortunately, when I mute everybody's line centrally, um, it only mutes the people that are already that have already called in. So, uh, after we get a lot more people logged on and on the line. I'll I'll probably have to centrally mute everybody's lines again, um, but I'll let you know if I'm going to do that so that my presenters um, can press pound six to unmute their own line. So good. welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started because we have an awful lot to get through. Welcome to Green Chill's November webinar. The topic is Condensed Innovations for Commercial Refrigeration. Very happy you all could join us. Uh, my name is Keely Whitman, and I'm in the EPA Stratospheric Protection Division. I'm the Green Chill Partnership, which is a cooperative alliance with the supermarket industry um, to reduce the industry's impact on the ozone layer and climate change. Agenda today, um, I'm just going to briefly explain the logistics of the webinar, um, give it a, a very quick um, green overview. Uh, we're going to have just a very, very, you know, oversimplified and basic um, condenser overview, and then we're going to start going into the innovations um, that have happened in the in the condenser field. Um, we're going to talk about innovations with air-cooled condensers. We're going to talk about water-cooled condensers, microchannel condensers, and hybrid condensers, and then uh, we have time for a 30-minute question and answer. So just very briefly on um, webinar etiquette, uh, so that all of you know, um, this webinar is being recorded. We uh, keep archives of past webinars on Green Chill's website. It's under events and webinars. Um, we'll post the recording of this webinar as soon as we can. Uh, your phones, again, um, should be muted. Um, to unmute them, you would pound six. Um, since we have to get through so much in such a short period of time, uh, I'm going to um, ask you to hold your questions until the question and answer period that starts at 3 o'clock. Um, but when that time does come, uh, the way that we'll manage so many people on here asking questions is down in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a little hand button. Um, if you go ahead and try that out, if you click that on, a little hand um, comes on my screen. There I have Dave has his hand up. Um, Damon has his hand up. Karen has her hand up. Okay, so that seems to be working. Um, and so if you have a question, just put your hand up, and then I'll kind of try to manage all the questions that come in. And um, you do have to click it again, though, to remove your hand. Um, otherwise, I will think that uh, that you have another question. Um, it's not a problem if you forget. Uh, and uh, just a general disclaimer, um, you know, please please note that we do these webinars for information sharing purposes. Uh, Green Chill and the EPA, we don't endorse products or companies. Um, the information that the presenters um, present to you is from them, um, I or EPA don't verify that information. Um, and the opinions of the presenters, they are their own. Um, they are not the opinions of Grishel or the EPA. Finally, um, this is more a, a, a plea for leniency more than anything else. Um, we are all not webinaring um, experts. Uh, People volunteer to speak on these webinars. Nobody's getting paid for it, and we're not. We don't have any graphics or or media or web specialists to help us with this. So occasionally um, things do go wrong, um, and uh, we try our best to fix it. And as I said before, we get a little bit better with each webinar. So um, very briefly about Green Chill. Um, Green has three basic programs. 
um, and these three, three programs make up um, the whole Green Chill program. So when you hear about Green Chill partners, um, we're talking about there is Green Chill's Corporate Emissions Reductions Program. And that is uh, companies, food retailers sign up to be Green Chill partners and they make a commitment to measure their refrigerant emissions and set annual goals to reduce those emissions. So those are the Green Chill partners you hear about. We will have a Green Chill store certification program that is open to everyone. Um, we award platinum, gold, or silver, silver Green Chill store certification for achieving um, charge size reductions, uh, leak rate reductions, um, I won't go into detail on that. There's a whole webinar actually on it in our webinar archives. Um, and that's open to uh, individual stores, both newly constructed stores and um, existing stores. If you can meet the standards, you, you can become a Green Chill certified store. Finally, the third program is the Advanced Refrigeration Program. And that's where you know, these webinars and all of our best practices guidelines and our, our uh, uh, discussion roundtables, our LinkedIn group, that's where all of that kind of stuff comes in. And, um, Green Chill is trying to promote for the benefit of the industry the use of um, green refrigeration technology strategies and practices. So all of those three programs together are how we achieve Green Chill's mission to reduce um, and emissions from the supermarket industry. So I'm going to hand over um, to uh, Dustin, and he is going to uh, start off presenting um, the, a, a fundamental description of condensers, and then he's going to go into air-cooled condensers. So, uh, Dustin, over to you. Okay. Thank you. This is Dun Atkinson from Heatcraft Refrigeration Products. I'm a product manager here. I'm going to start off, as she mentioned, going through basically a condenser overview. On your screen now, you should see um, a slide, and on the right side of the slide, you should see a graphic that is a basic refrigeration cycle. Here I have a compressor, a condenser, and a unit cooler or evaporator. The main function of the condenser, our topic of the day, is simply to reject or move heat from a system by condensing the refrigerant vapor into a liquid. The a couple of key components that regardless of the specific type of condenser you're pretty much going to have. First off is a heat exchanger or a coil of some type and some method of heat removal. That may be for convection or simply airflow or be water or a variety of other media. Uh, there are really four key types of condensers to keep in mind. First would be air-cooled condenser, and that's going to include both round tube plate fan and uh, most microchannel condensers. There will be evaporative condensers, water-cooled condensers, and then also hybrid, which are essentially uh, condensers that have both air-cooled and evaporative-cooled capabilities. The next basically outline some of the key advantages and disadvantages of traditional air-cooled condensers. Traditional air-cooled condensers are going to be very low maintenance because you're not going to have to ha worry about adding water or chemicals. It's also going to be reduced height. And since you don't have water in the system, you're not typically going to have to worry about any freeze-up issues in cold climates. They're going to be lighter weight and you're going to have lower upfront capital costs, and that's partially going to be driven by uh, pumps uh, utilized in the system, but also a variety of structural items. There are, of course, trade offs there. Uh, there is the potential for higher condensing temperatures, head pressures, in particularly dry climates. There is the potential for a larger footprint, and there is a point at which the capacity is just beyond what you would want to use additional air-cooled condenser for. That's way beyond what you would run into in pretty much any supermarket application, but the maximum capacity limitation does exist. I'm going to step through some key refrigerant-reducing innovations and options in traditional air-cooled condensers. 
the major item I'm going to touch on here is a transition away from fully flooded head pressure control. Basically what we've seen over recent years is kind of a trend moving first from fully flooded to then fan cycling, uh, variable speed motors, and now we're seeing a lot of variable speed motors with fan cycling. Basically what each of these uh, progressive steps allow you to do is reduce the amount of coil flooding to maintain appropriate head pressures. There it substantially reduces the actual refrigerant that is uh, required to be in the system to maintain that head pressure. The next item I'm going to step through are a variety of fan motor speed offerings. Basically what you're going to see here is for the most part, a trade-off between refrigerant charge and energy or sound. Typically, by decreasing fan speed, you're going to have to increase coil size, which is going to in turn increase refrigerant charge, but you're going to see decreased energy consumption and decreased sound. Essentially, you're going to have to pick some trade-off between those three, or the four if you include refrigerant charge. So an increased number of potential motor speeds uh, provides you an enhanced ability to select the system that is most optimally suited to your needs. Next step in that is going to be variable speed fan motors. This is going to allow you to operate at max speed or a very high speed when high capacity requirements are present. So you don't have to have an enhanced refrigerant or larger refrigerant charge to be able to do that. But you're going to be able to operate at lower fan speeds when a lower capacity requirement is in place. So that's going to substantially improve your energy and sound performance while still allowing you to have pretty moderate refrigerant charge uh, levels. One thing to keep in mind there is typically for any given reduction in fan speed, you're going to see an energy reduction that is the cube of that number. So you're going to see substantial energy savings even with a pretty small decrease in fan speed. And keep in mind, as I just mentioned a moment ago, by having variable speed, you can have very efficient head pressure control as well. So you get dual efficiencies there from the variable speed operation. The number I'm going to talk on about doesn't specifically reduce refrigerant charge, but it does substantially reduce leak potential. A fan tube coil basically isolates the refrigerant carrying tubes from the weight bearing structures in the unit. So none of the refrigerant tubes will be bearing the physical weight of the unit. Um, that reduces the wear and tear on the coil, so it substantially reduces the leak potential, particularly at the tube sheets. Um, so you're going to see a substantial reduction in the potential for tube sheet leaks there. The next item I'm going to talk about is enhanced refrigerant tubes. Basically, this option is going to focus on improving the internal heat transfer capability of the, the tube and then the coil, which allows you to reduce the coil size for a given capacity. That in turn is going to substantially reduce the refrigerant charge that is associated with a given capacity. Next I'm going to talk about is condenser splitting. Basically here what we're going to do is segment off one circuit of the condenser out of the refrigerant flow during say winter time operation so that you don't have to add refrigerant in order to or add a substantial amount of refrigerant in order to maintain acceptable head pressure levels. Substantially reduces refrigerant charge for that reason. The thing I'm going to touch on is smaller diameter refrigerant tubes. Basically, here what you're doing is say reducing the di diameter of the tubes, which in turn reduces the internal diameter or internal volume that is in the coil. Therefore, you have to have less refrigerant associated with that coil. There are trade-offs there because you are going to have higher pressure drops. That's going to typically restrict the size of coil that is going to be uh, applicable for any given tube diameter. 
for you're not typically going to see a seven fan long condenser that's going to have a quarter inch or even three eighths inch tubes because typically given normal circuiting just not going to be practical the important thing to really keep in mind there is where you can get by with a smaller diameter tubing they'll typically provide some pretty appreciable refrigerant charge reduction the last uh, refrigerant focused item for traditional condensers I'm going to step through is going to be variable fins per inch. But what you're going to be doing here by varying fins per inch is varying the capacity at a given internal coil volume. By increasing fins per inch you're able to maintain a higher capacity on the same refrigerant charge. So you're going to see a higher BTU per pound of refrigerant versus a lower uh, fins per inch selection. So it is going to provide you some potentially substantial refrigerant charge reduction as well. Just in conclusion, there are really a variety of steps, even in traditional air-cooled condensers, that can take when selecting a unit to pretty substantially reduce refrigerant charge and energy. Uh, what I've talked about here today is just a small subset of all the options that are available to you out in the market, um, but we would be happy to uh, follow up outside with any additional questions or any additional information I can provide for you. I would be happy to do so. And Kyla, that is uh, essentially all I have for this presentation. Okay. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you very much, Dustin. Um, I appreciate it. I appreciate the information on... Um, innovations in air-cooled condensers, and thank you very much for doing the general uh, condenser overview also. Um, uh, next person um, to speak is Harrison Horning. Uh, I I couldn't find a manufacturer for the water-cooled condenser um, presentation. Uh, Harrison was going to originally just give the um, user's perspective for uh, the water-cooled condensers, which each one of the manufacturers had the opportunity to invite a green chill partner to, to give a user's perspective after they were done presenting. Um, so Harrison was nice enough to both give us the overview on water-cooled condensers and give us the user's perspective. So Harrison, you, you have control of the slides now. If you want to go ahead and advance, there you go. Okay, thank you, Keely. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about water-cooled condensers, and uh, as I said, I'm going to kind of wear two hats. I'll start by giving uh, a little bit of maybe the manufacturer's side in terms of the design, and then I'll put my operator's hat on and talk a little bit about my operating experience. Um, a lot of ways to do this. Um, uh, commercial refrigeration, there's no, there's no one right answer. And so, uh, you know, this is just one other one other way to approach it. And uh, I think, as we pointed out earlier, um, this is really a, um, an innovative technology. I mean, the idea of water-cooled condensing has been around a long time, but perhaps the application is somewhat innovative. So, to start with a simple uh, schematic to give you the concept of what we're talking about. What we're talking about here is condensing in a brazed plate heat exchanger. Uh, the device shown in the middle, um, and be located near the rack. Uh, black lines here are re refrigerant, and the red lines are a water glycol mixture. We can the charge significantly by close coupling this condenser near the rack. Uh, and an example is we might take it from a well, thousand pound charge in, in a traditional air-cooled condenser down to about 600 pound charge. In this example, uh, it's pretty significant savings in the refrigerant, as well as uh, you're eliminating a lot of the high pressure piping and uh, fittings where uh, you, you expect to reduce your, your leak potential as well. Um, I have a pump and a fluid cooler. The fluid cooler is showing it uh, as a potentially also including heat reclaim, but the fluid cooler is basically going to be on the roof. Uh, it's going to look just like an air cooled condenser, except it might have slightly bigger tubing uh, to make the uh, per drop acceptable on the glycol. But so you have the, the, the uh, heat exchanger, a fluid cooler, 
uh, minimum to, to make this work. Now, I want to mention that the, the heat exchanger does represent an additional pre uh, uh, temperature difference. Uh, so, you know, there's a little bit of a, a loss in efficiency here, but we make up for that by, by setting these two components, the condenser and the fluid cooler, to each take about half of the TD, the temperature difference. And so uh, you end up, you know, condensing at about the same temperature that you would have with an air cooled condenser. Um, the piece that we show here is the receiver that would be located uh, just below the condenser, uh, and that's basically part of the uh, part of the refrigeration system. To this, um, I would say the main reason is climate change concerns, uh, need to reduce refrigerant emissions. Um, we assume that the R22 already gone, and this would be in a new system, which would be R22, or even in a retrofit system, in which case we would be replacing R22 if it was there. So the big, big benefit now is uh, is on the uh, reduced global warming potential and, uh, you know, reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, I mentioned the charge can go from 1,000 down to 600 pounds as an example. And another thing that happens is we get pretty stable operation, and that allows for receiver-level monitoring. I'll show an example of that in a minute. Um, the other bullets talk about some of the uh, the benefits in terms of energy benefits and economic benefits in a cold climate. Uh, now that we're condensing into this glycol loop, we have a, a loop of warm water uh, or warm glycol that can be piped to HVAC units uh, very handily, and that can displace purchase fuel, which can provide economic savings that will allow for us to get money to build more of these. Um, now, as an example of what that might look like, you might have a three valve in the glycol loop where you're, you're, you can move that glycol to HVAC coils and get useful heat into your space. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, heat reclaim to, to air here into uh, space heating, uh, not water heating. This will run at uh, 90 to 100 degrees, depending on conditions. Uh, and so this coil has to be sized for that uh, lower temp water, you know, lower than you might have with a boiler system. Okay, but it's a very uh, substantial amount of BTUs and can, can provide useful heat. Um, I want to give you a kind of a, this is a 3 uh, rendering of what these things look like. They're not real sexy, and they're they're not up on roofs with blue sky and clouds in the background. They're usually in dingy mechanical rooms, and so I, I don't have a photo, uh, but this gives you an idea of what it looks like. Here, a braised plate heat exchanger, and this would be fed with refrigerant uh, probably in here and then out here. Um, on, on the side of it, you have uh, the glycol is coming here and out here, and you have the end for the glycol to go to a fluid cooler or to a heat reclaim system as controlled by some wave valves. And what we're using is two, two valves, uh, you know, opposing each other to simulate a three-way valve. So you pump. Yeah. When you're clicking stuff on with those, we can't. Um, we can't. When you say go in here and out there, um, oh, we I'm can't sorry. see your mouse. What okay. you can do though, uh, that's all right. What you can do though, if you see up above, there's a little uh, pen. You, it's it's a yeah, highlighter. Symbol of a pen. Yeah, exactly. Click that on and, and click pen, and you can then draw on your slide. And and if you would, I find it very interesting if you could if you could do that over again and do your oh, okay. Go in here and out here. Here, uh, uh, oops, see an arrow? Like, like Keely's not an expert. This is refrigerant <laughs> in, and your refrigerant out would be something like this. Um, and your, your glycol in would be something like this, and out here. And then, oops, that goes out this way. Um, what you can do then is you can switch. Um, if you wanted to have it switch over to heat reclaim, then it would come in here instead. We have we have valves here that uh, serve the purpose of, uh, of like a three-way valve. Okay. Uh, at the bottom, you see a condenser. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry. At the bottom, you see a receiver. Uh, and so that, that part of the system is the same as a, as a conventional system. So just to give you an idea of what the hardware might look like. The next one I want to go to uh, is... Um, level monitoring. This is just a graph of actual data from one of these systems that shows uh, 
um, by what we do is by monitoring the receiver level, which is I think fairly common practice. Uh, you, you can always get a reading of what is your receiver level, and you get into your your uh, building uh, edge monitoring system or building automation system. And the trick is to really take a, a average of the full day. Uh, these points are each one full day, so you average the full day, and that's a stable uh, type of a, of a plot. Otherwise, you're going to see a lot of uh, volatility in the, in the receiver level moving up and down constantly. Uh, because of uh, what's going on in there, you might have different things happening in your systems with defrost and such. And um, in any case, by averaging it over a day, you get a nice stable plot. This is a very handy way for us to know uh, when we have a leak and you can see that we have a slow leak over over time. And then it was identified and it was repaired and now we end up with a fairly uh, stable flat plot, which is what we always want. Um, so this is going to be a handy tool. Um, I just quickly put on my operator's hat and talk a bit about uh, things maybe I didn't cover yet. Um, like I said, the, the, something to keep in mind if you wanted to try one of these is you're going to need uh, uh, something on the roof, which will call a fluid cooler, which looks a lot like a condenser and costs about the same, maybe a little bit more again because it might have thicker tubing. Um, your your water glycol loop is going to require um, proper water chemistry and cleanliness. We don't want to plug up, up this plate exchanger. Um, you know, a lot of experience with, with this type of technology in the refrigeration world uh, because we use this type of thing with subcoolers and such and we're, we're very comfortable with running refrigerant through these things. Uh, and, and quite frankly, we've had good success here running water glycol through them, too, but you want to be careful with that and make sure that you don't somehow get uh, any kind of uh, sediment or anything in your water glycol loop that could crap the thing up because that would be a bad thing. Um, the pump is a critical component. Uh, it needs to be, uh, if that breaks, you need to fix it in a hurry. And so, like, we'll just spare a pump handy, and uh, our guys have all been trained to take that down and get it back up and running in about an hour. Um, and like I said, subcooling can be added to these systems. Um, that would be done. That's on the refrigeration on the refrigerant side. It wouldn't be a, that different than uh, than any other system. Uh, I mentioned the the key features of the system in terms of green chill is reducing the charge potentially by something like 40 percent, um, and by eliminating most of the high pressure piping, uh, we expect that we would reduce the number of leaks as well. Um, Stabilization, uh, you can do the receiver level monitoring like I showed you. We, we do actually use that and um, a nice, a nice uh, way for, for our uh, managers to be kind of uh, on, their, on their computers checking things out and then alerting the technicians when they see something suspicious. And uh, you really can get to things within a matter of days or, or at the most weeks. And, and on these slow leaks, that's pretty good. I mean, you can get in there and make, make make a, a fix pretty efficiently. Um, I mean, that this can be coupled with advanced heat reclaim. That's, uh, as a user, that's a real benefit uh, in terms of saving money on, uh, you know, curing that heat and displacing purchased fuel. Um, and um, so I guess, in summary, the, the key benefits of this approach would be lower refrigerant emissions, which is, um, you know, better for the... Uh, environment, and uh, also the idea that you can possibly couple it with heat reclaim to uh, to save money. And uh, that's the end of my two presentations. Great, Harrison. Thanks very much. And, and thanks especially for uh, for agreeing to wear both of those hats for us. Uh, I, I appreciate that you volunteered to do this for us. Um, I'm going to hand over next to um, Jeff Waller, and he is going to present uh, the topic of microchannel condensers. So, um, Jeff, over to you. Go ahead. Jeff, uh, you may have to hit um, well. Okay, thank you. I'm Jeff Wall. I've been an engineer for a number of years. I'm working for Hosman now as a specialist on systems. I'm in the United States uh, consulting with the customers on what types of systems serve their priorities best. Um, just to get started, uh, people ask me about microchannel condensers.
sensors. It's basically a technology that's been around in the automotive industry for a number of years. Uh, it's a aluminum fit tube that basically uh, is very fat and allows to reduce the internal volume required for a given amount of heat transfer. Uh, basically reduces the charge uh, in the system. To hide a few of the things that we see, it reduces the internal volume. It reduces your flooding charge by about 50 percent. Uh, reduces the size and weight that have, that's required for the condenser. We also build these in a modular design, which uh, allows for easy future expansion. Uh, we have uh, replaceable coast labs. Uh, we also have available winter flooding controls with these, uh, which allows us to isolate the coil sections for winter operations. I'll point out that these are all aluminum fins and tubes, so unlike a standard tube and fin condenser, which is copper and some other combination of fins, uh, all very similar metals, so we have less chance for galvanic corrosion. Just a little bit of data on comparing a standard Levator condenser with one of microchannels. Uh, at 404A, just the uh, given the heat of rejection there, we come up with a reduction in weight of about 533 pounds. Reduction in charge of about 171 pounds when using this technology. The visual, uh, what the design looks like, what you can see here, and I'll try to get my pointer going. I hope I can do that. Um, this is B channel section, two fins, and they're modular. You can just keep adding sections as you want to make the condenser bigger. We have uh, some coil design for every application. We just basically increase the number of fans and the number of fan banks uh, in the condenser to get our capacity. Now, what does it mean for your customer, for the customer or the store user? Uh, it allows us to get green chill, various levels of green chill, depending on the application. We do have some stores with silver, and we do have some stores with gold levels in the field. Tell you that design layout is critical. Uh, as you're well aware, most of everybody is well aware, the liquid line from the receiver out to the cases is a substantial holder of refrigerant. So if you have real long line runs, uh, that's a particular parameter that you have to also design on if you want to get green chill. Uh, do see silver and gold level certifications mainly with uh, distributed systems. Uh, also use smaller receivers and smaller line runs. Decide to use this technology with a CO2 or a glycol system, you have a possible platinum certification depending on the design of the store. Basically, we've designed this around a true floating coil design where we basically have the slab free to expand and contract as it needs to. So we account for the variability in the manufacturing process in our original design. We've had some issues in the field that I will talk about in just a second that we've since corrected. So the result uh, of our initial design was we had some uh, excessive preload stresses that allow for the full expansion and the thermal stresses that the condenser saw in the wintertime. And done some field modifications uh, that uh, have improved this uh, and have reduced the stresses, as you will see, uh, about 3% in preload stress and 48% reduction in thermal stress. So we feel by using this particular area right here, I can get pointer to work correctly. Thank you. Uh, design in here, well, we've got a free floating uh, coil design now. We've uh, changed the system around. So now we have a, a, a system that we feel is uh, going to be much more viable going forward. And some of the different things. Uh, it's a bar of field repair. Uh, our coils are easily field replaceable in case of damage. Uh, we can get a coil slab shipped out very quickly. These clubs weigh about 40 pounds. So they're very easy to lift and put in place. Uh, it's cleaning that comes, a uh, question that surfaces a lot with these. Uh, some people are concerned about the fin spacing. Uh, they're very easy to be easily clean. Uh, the coil depth is only about an inch and a half versus a six to ten inch uh, coil depth on a standard condenser. Uh, it does it does uh, clog up, but it's very easy to, to clean. So all it requires is a, a little 90 degree nozzle to wash from the inside and 
under 500 PSI is recommended. Okay, well, that's it. Uh, Keith, I'll turn it over back to you, and we'll anticipate questions, if any, later. Okay, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to turn over now to Paul Noreen, who is going to present on hybrid condensers. And then after him, um, Steve Hagen from Fresh and Easy volunteered to give a user's perspective on hybrid condensers also. So, uh, Paul, you have control of the slides. Go ahead. Um, Paul, I think you have to hit pound six. If you're talking, we can't hear you. Oh, now. now I hear you. Go ahead. Thank you, Keely. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Paul Noreen. And it's an honor to speak to the Green Chill Group. <laughs> I've really been impressed with the uh, collaboration this group generates in our industry. And someone that's very passionate about the environment makes it even more important to me. <clears throat> the first slide is simply showing a few pictures for you to get a general idea of what a hybrid condenser looks like. And then go into some details on the operation. Um, hybrid technology has been for a long time, but it's just fairly new in our industry. Um, there's thousands of hybrid condensers operating around the world. Sensor technology, it truly offers the best of both worlds. It offers simplicity of air-cooled condensers the majority of the time. How warm day when activated, it offers more energy savings to an evaporative condenser by providing lower condensing temperatures when you need it most. Now, in locations around this country, the hybrid uses 75% less water than an evaporative condenser would use and does not require any water treatment because a small six-gallon sump is flushed out daily when not in use. Now, this particular application uses the microchannel DL coils, which are vertically positioned, and those hand pads in the picture are one of the coils. So the print is much smaller than a standard condenser because of the capacity achieved using that evaporative system and the micro channels together. Uh, between the two of them, it's a powerful combination. The benefit is because the coil surface is a lot smaller. You need condenser fans to operate. So less fans turning is even greater condensed fan energy savings. So the capacity gained using the evaporative cooling in the micro channel coil high for significant energy savings over standard <coughs> technologies. Now, the simplicity of the hybrid is really amazing. The vertical microchannel coil that's to the right is positioned behind a very um, extremely effective evaporative cooling system on the left. There are two universal solenoid valves that control the water with a one-third horsepower pump pump that will you in a minute. What happens here is when the ambient temperature rises above the design wet bulb, which is average about 75 degrees, the water system is activated. So the temperature that the denser coil feels can be lowered by as much as 20 degrees. Now keep in mind the water never comes in contact with the coil. Uh, so water is evaporated by the warm air, thus lowering the air temperature into the condenser coil. Water that is not evaporated goes back into the sump and can just to recirculate over those evaporative pads. The water evaporates, the sump float allows more water to come in. And keep one in mind, for every degree of lowered condensing temperature, it can be a gain of 1.6 EER, which is energy efficiency ratio for the entire system. Showing um, the mode of operation in it. I don't want it to sound complicated because it's extremely simple. Uh, it's divided into two, and the first one is the variable speed smart ECM fan motors, and this being the evaporative water system. Those fan motors are what we call smart motors, the dual voltage, and they require a three-phase line voltage feed. <clears throat> In other words, you don't have to tell if it's 208 or 460. It, it understands. Now, control side, it just requires a simple 0 to 10 volt analog signal and that are the variable speed fans. Fans can be controlled by a TD control, low pressure, discharge pressure. I mean, how I you control your fans now, you can control them use it with a hybrid. Zero control votes, the fan motors are going to come to a complete stop. In a 10-volt 
they're going to be running at full RPM, which is 980 RPMs. And the motor's uh, not only efficient, but very quiet. Keep in mind that evaporative system in most of the country is going to be inactive 75% of the time. So it's going to operate more like an air-cooled condenser most of the time. Those two solenoids, the water solenoids, are activated and deactivated by ambient temperature. One is water inlet, and the other is the drain, which you'll see in a minute. The outlet water solenoids actually work opposite each other. One is open and one is always closed. To keep in mind with this slide is that your reduction in the ambient air on the lower part of the screen that passes through that evaporative pad. 16 degree temperature reduction provide significant energy savings on hot days when you need it. More importantly, your utility company needs it most. And keep in mind, most utility companies offer significant rebates for this technology. We have some rebates pay as much as 50% of the installed cost. So on this slide, I'm showing um, the, the different components, but what I'm trying to get across here is that everything on the hybrid is easily accessible for servicing. The um, right hand corner shows the hinge top, top uh, up and it's uh, the, um, the evaporative pads, and behind that is the uh, to the microchannel condenser coils. And we recommend like a biannual maintenance similar to that of an air-cooled condenser. The side to the right is access through a hinge door. It only holds about six gallons of water during operation. And the metal diamond plate around the pump so it's a real simple process to get in and inspect that pump. And that evaporative system is only going to be activated on warm days. So most of the time, this unit will operate dry with a sump and not use any water. Now, the, that valve on the bottom left um, is drain valves, and that empties that small six-gallon sump on a daily basis, but only if that ambient temperature has risen to about 75 degrees to condensing temperature down. Refrigeration system operating at peak efficiency. Now, this slide uh, shows a comparison between um, a standard air cooled condenser with a tube and fin construction, a hybrid condenser with micro channel, and a couple of evaporative condensers. And the first takeaway to make note of is the weight and dimension difference. Um, a hybrid condenser is almost half the weight of a standard air cooled condenser, and less compared to an evaporative condenser. Condenser. So it doesn't require roof steel. A curb is more than enough. The charge is almost half that of an air-cooled, uh, standard air-cooled tube and fin, and even less than that of an evaporative condenser of the same capacity. <clears throat> so look at the, uh, the refrigerant uh, portion of it. It's fairly compelling. The hybrid with microchannel condensers is going to need less refrigerant. Finally, look at the water savings difference between the hybrid and the evaporative condenser. The hybrid is a fraction of the water motions. To set the past few minutes regarding the hybrid condenser, um, hope you can see that a hybrid is a viable option to think about um, when you're making a, about condensers. And think about specifically the following benefits. <clears throat> the re refrigerant charge in the condenser due to the channel technology and the fact that the condenser surface is smaller because we use an Evaporative cooling. Um, that evaporative cooling packs a powerful punch. 20% lower operating system cost due to the lower condensing temperatures achieved during, again, when it's on during warm weather. And there's a fraction of the water and no chemicals compared to evaporative condensing due to that daily drain flush. The water contacting the core surface. Footprint, less steel. And it only needs a small roof curb, um, and the operation is extremely simple. I can't, uh, I can't say that enough. It's really efficient and effective technology. And a key takeaway is that the hybrid works best when you need it most. And what I mean by that is, you know, on hot days when the warm weather arrives, um, Paul, I, I think we. I lost you. Oh, we did. No, you're back. Go ahead. Sorry, but I don't know why that happened. Sorry. 
Uh, you were you when we lost you. You were talking about um, it works best when we need it the most. Okay, so just lost a little, little bit. Basically, what I mean by that is on warm, you know, in warm weather when uh, the refrigeration struggle the, struggles the most. Uh, air cooled condensing, the hybrid kicks that evaporative cooling part in, and it becomes really environmentally friendly and efficient. So, Keelan concludes my presentation on the uh, hybrid condenser technology. Okay, oh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I know this technology is something um, new to me. I, I haven't had the opportunity to see it in action yet. Um, by, and I'm looking forward now to hearing Steve Hagen's user's perspective. Um, he has a lot of experience with these. So, um, Steve, can you tell us a little bit about hybrid condensers from the user side? I think you have to hit pound six. If you're talking, we can't hear you. Can you know, Kylie? I can hear you now. Yep. Um, you know, surprisingly, there, there's actually applications for all of the technologies and products discussed today. I mean, um, everybody in unique situations where certain things make sense. Mixed-use buildings, water cool condensers are, are very uh, necessary because you just can't put the condenser in close enough proximity to the refrigeration system. And as far as you know, the new thing for air cooled condensers, the microchannel and the refrigeration reduction. The smaller footprint of your weight. I mean, everything about them says that that's the future of the industry. And when it when it comes to the hybrid condensers, putting treaters on air cooled condensers isn't new. Um, but the hybrid condenser has kind of taken things to a new level with the with the integrated unit that's designed for use that way. And smart motors where you don't even need a drive that you can just send a signal to them and speed them up and slow them down as you need. It answers a lot of the problems in terms of uh, the water crisis that's coming up with paying for it with added refrigerant or energy. You get kind of like a win-win situation where normally you have trade-offs. Uh, it's particularly useful in the in the southwest where that condensers uh, with all the water treatment issues and the um, scaling and all of them issues for treatment. Hybrid eliminates them issues, but you don't pay for it in energy like you do with air cool. Um, even when you get in the coastal areas that are warm in the summer, where you said, "Well, I'm going to go air cooled, even though it's going to cost me on energy. I'm going to do, um, you know, condenser anyway." The hybrid meets both needs. It doesn't use too much water, so the seas aren't all over you about your water usage. You don't pay in energy, and when you need the water, you don't use it. Um, so we changed our prototype hybrid condensers, uh, and of course we're looking forward to the evap condenser manufacturers who are now fast working on their options for a hybrid condenser to enter the market so that we can have a more competitive market. But uh, take on where the technology is, and there may be applications where it's hot and humid, where the Hybrid doesn't work. Phoenix is one of them sites where it works, but not as well as I'd like it to, so we're going to stay with the VAT there. But everywhere else, even the deserts of California, that uh, will switch to the hybrid design. So that's pretty much it. Okay, thank you. Um, I ate it. Uh, let's see here. Um, good. So that ends uh, the presentation part. I, I can't, I almost can't believe my eyes. We're actually finishing a little bit early. Um, that has never happened in the history of Green Chill webinars. Um, so thank you very much to our presenters and our speakers. Um, I know I, I was a little, um, a little doubtful that you guys could do it. Uh, so I, I guess I owe everybody an apology. You, you, you not only not only did you manage to come in um on the the time that I gave you you all you all managed to save time so um a, a figurative or theoretical pat on the back to all of you from me um thanks again so uh, I guess what we'll do is um we'll open up for questions a little bit earlier 
Uh, as I said, there's the little hand down at the lower right hand corner of your screen. Um, if you have a question, uh, please put your hand up. Um, Charlie Garlow, uh, I see your hand. Um, you may have to hit pound six so we can hear you. Go ahead and ask your question. Charlie here, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Great. I was wondering uh, what, at what size, I'm sorry I missed the, the first part of the presentation, what size of commercial equipment does this make sense for, and does it make it sense even down at the residential level? Oh, interesting. Um, uh, I guess of our speakers, um, I'm not exactly. Can you answer that? I'm. I'm. I don't know which one of you would be ideal in answering that. Anyone want, want to volunteer? Specific. And do you have a question about a specific one of these technologies, or in them in general? Well, the hard. That this sounds like your favorite. I'm wondering if it is available for, for smaller units or just larger units. Does it make sense? I can I can answer that a little bit, and this is Keith Hannon. and Paul might be able to answer it even more. Um, I think it I think it's applicable uh, and and and, it, and from a 3,000 square foot uh, Caesar. In terms of the the scalability of their size, the units to uh, you know a super center. So uh, I don't know. Paul would have to add, answer a little bit more. I think they have some different technologies they use more for their industrial uh, applications. Yeah, yeah. Just Paul, I could uh, I could answer that a little further. Um, well, the 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 one thing um, to keep in mind is the the micro channel. Uh, Coil that we use has limitations as far as how how big it, it can go horizontally, uh, but what we're able to do is uh, put them in vertically. Now, as far as from a residential perspective, uh, we haven't uh, we haven't we haven't ventured there yet, but um, I think that the technology itself is sound. It can certainly be, uh, I mean, we just haven't, yet, but it's certainly sound. I mean, on air conditioning or refrigeration. Um, again, trying to do it, it's it's not that much different than if uh, you know your outside air conditioner in your house and you took a sprinkler and, and uh, created a fine mist, sprayed it in, it would be give the same effect, although you'd be using a lot of water and you'd be damaging the coil. Uh, whereas the hard runs the water down in front of the coil on those evaporative pads. Uh, I'm not sure if that completely answered your question. The answer it sounds like the business the, the end is um, maybe you'll have smaller and smaller units that will be effective uh, financially effective for places um, um, storefronts and and many other places in the United States where maybe the relative humidity is like Washington D.C. is uh, not so great for, for things. Hey, Charlie, let me ask um, let me ask both uh, Jeff and and Dustin. Uh, Jeff, I think I know Hussman. I, I think you guys are mainly commercial refrigeration. Is there another part of Ingersoll Rand that um, that is exploring microchannel condenser units in other areas other than supermarkets and commercial refrigeration? Can you? Hear me? Am I on? Yes. Yes. Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, okay. Scale is, it's small, so. Yeah. Okay. And what about Dustin? Your the the standard. Uh, some of the innovations you talked about to the standard. Okay. I, I've been corrected, Keely, by Buddy, who's sitting here. So I'm gonna let him answer that question. Oh. Okay. Buzz, sure. Um, yes, my old technology is being pursued by um, a number of EMs for residential applications for air conditioning. Probably just there's no ag projects in the works as far as doing any type of evaporative cooling for residential units though. So. Okay. But is there is something going on with microchannel condensers for, for residential? Yes, there is. Okay. Interesting. Encouraging. 
What about um, Dustin? Some of the innovations you talked about um, for uh, standard air-cooled condensers. I'd like to take a slightly broader approach to that. I would like to start off by saying that uh, everyone presented a pretty wide portfolio of products. And really one of the things to keep in mind is definitely each one of these solutions is going to have its key areas where it's going to shine. Um, of course, with a higher humidity, you might tend not to go toward a hybrid or an EVAP system where it might make complete sense in a really low humidity, warm environment. Uh, I can say that I would see micro channels specific moving pretty much across the industry. We have had for a couple of years out in the field a small half through six horsepower micro channel condenser that's been very, very successful. We see pretty much uh, the same refrigerant charge reductions and same benefits that were mentioned on the Hussman micro channel unit. And I can definitely say at this time, uh, I would expect us to see a uh, micro channel condenser coming out from Heatcraft. I would say probably by the middle of the year next year, early in the year next year. And I see that coming out from a residential um, from a variety of companies probably at some point as well. Okay, great. Well, that that's encouraging. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone else have a question? If I don't see any any other hands up, because I, I have a question, actually. Maybe I can fill the gap and... Um, and uh, while I'm asking this, um, maybe others of you uh, can come up with some questions. It's a shame of um, this level of, of expertise here on the webinar and not take advantage of it and, and uh, ask all your questions. So I, I, I hope you feel comfortable enough to come forward with them. But in the meantime, um, I, I'm thinking about uh, the relevance of, of retrofit situations for all all of these different type of condenser innovations. So um, it, 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 does it make sense to even think about, um, you know, if, if you're currently sitting in a store and, you know, you have a, a let's say, a 10-year-old um, standard air-cooled condenser, um, does it, it, and you're planning a major remodel, um, is there any way to take advantage of some of these innovations in a um, you know, the fact in, in a situation other than new store construction. If, if each of you um, could make a comment on that, uh, if, it, if, it, if it would make sense financially, um, you know, feel free to say that too. You want to start? I repeat that. Is it so? So let's say you're sitting there. You have an an old store with an older standard air cooled condenser before some of these you know innovations came out that save on refrigerant charge size and help fight leaks and and help save energy and and help save water and and all of this other stuff. Um, does it make sense to think about um, trying to incorporate some of the innovations you talked about? Up to your condenser after the fact, it, you know, is is it even is possible, um, you know, to to kind of I don't know buy buy new parts, new components, um, you know, would would you have to just kind of pluck out the old condenser and put in a new condenser? Um, any of these innovations applicable to people who who might want to upgrade? and take advantage of some of these innovations? To a certain extent. Um, you could potentially go to different motors. Um, there are various motors that would be available, whether it be a lower RPM motor or potentially a variable speed solution, if you could come up with that. Uh, there's all the option to simply remodel or expand with more efficient updated equipment. And there is also, if you're particularly interested in the adiabatic or water-assisted or hybrid type approach, you can actually get those pads separately. So you can actually retrofit an existing installation with that product. So there are a fair number of solutions that could potentially be utilized. Uh, really, probably the most effective way, if you can get away with it, is to go with a major remodel or an expansion using uh, modern and advanced technologies. Thanks. Um, or, or Paul, or Harrison, or Steve, do you have 
anything to that? Well, keeping from our perspective at Hussman, it, it certainly is applicable for remodels. Um, if a customer wants to come in and remodel a store and he's trying to expand a little bit, he could he might even be able to get away with a smaller size condenser with less weight if he's got structural concerns on the roof. So definitely uh, remodel could be used for to drop charge and also to drop weight. Okay, great. Uh, this is Paul. I could pipe. Yeah, that's actually uh, uh, a good option. Um, uh, I mean, if you about the condenser, the condenser is uh, is probably one of the most important parts of the refrigeration system, and um, you know, holds a can hold a lot of refrigerant, and uh, can be a factor in how much energy the system uses. So, on a replacement issue, uh, typically do replace condensers, and it's actually a, a Part of our business where the rebate uh, uh, portion really kicks in. Um, if you're going to replace it with energy, that's going to save energy. Hmm. Interesting. So this this isn't this the conditions are not limited to people who are building new stores. Um, it it's all to extend or another. It's it's relevant also to people with. Um, Existing older systems out there. Yeah, exactly, because condensers, uh, you know, if you think about it, they sit on a roof in the wet in all kinds of weather, so they do over time need to be replaced. And okay. if you think of a condenser that was put in 10 or 15 years ago, has standard fan motors and, and uh, you know, with the new CM fan motors and uh, mechanical coils and <clears throat> the batics and all that, there's a whole lot more energy energy efficient options available today. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, any any other questions? I I can't believe that um that we have all of these guys here and uh and no questions. Oh, Dave from CTA, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, now I can hear you. Go ahead. I'm curious on what the added costs are for the the hybrid um, just so far, I mean, is it twice as much as a standard air cool condenser? Or good question. Paul. This is Paul uh, from Muller. Uh, it, it really depends um, it's on uh, you know, like a refrigeration rack system is built to a specific size, whereas a condenser is not built to a specific size. There's certain sizes. So sometimes, uh, you know, depending on whether we can use one condenser. Or occasion, or we have to use um, two condensers and put them in parallel it has a lot to do with the upfront capital cost. Um, in general, we could be uh, and sometimes 30% higher than a standard denser, but um, in, in most applications, um, with energy savings, we're typically under a two year payback. And then if you consider the rebate, and again, just about every project we've been involved with offers some sort of uh, rebate from the utility company. Um, so again, they've all been, you know, less than two-year payback. Uh, did I answer that? Okay, Dave. You did. Thanks. And Dave, I'd I'd like to follow up too on um, just just get that question out there for all of the different types of condensers. I'm wondering if um. If the um, Hussman can give, uh, obviously not a dollars and cents number, but but some kind of you know general feeling, it, are micro channel condensers more expensive than the standard air cooled condensers, and and if so, you know approximately how much? And and Harrison can give us an idea too uh, about uh, water cooled condensers. Well, this is Hussman Keeley. Um, the micro condenser itself, just if you look at equipment only, it will cost you a little more, but in cost, if you factor in the cost of refrigerant, if you're comparing that, the cost of possible structural uh, things that you might have to do with a standard condenser that you might not have to do with a microchannel, it could be a cheaper installed cost. Uh, Buzz, can you give a fee for the percentage difference between standard and a microchannel as far as equipment? No, no. I've seen numbers slightly more, but uh, 
again, can get install costs, it might be a net savings. Hi, this is Dustin Atkinson from Heatcraft. I would like to concur on one very important item, and that's that you look at total installed cost, because that's definitely going to be a major factor. Obviously, throughout the country, labor rates vary substantially, water rates vary substantially, and electricity rates vary substantially. So if you're taking a pretty holistic approach to this, that's definitely going to be the best way to make sure that you're getting the best solution for your application possible. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, that, that gives us a little bit of perspective. Um, anybody else have any questions? Um, go ahead. Hello? Hello? Go ahead. I have a question for Paul. Uh, the the pads, the evaporative pads, uh, the added pressure that they add to the fans, uh, they compare with uh, other means of adiabatic, like the I've seen the awnings uh, provide shade, and that they're also um, sprayed with water. Um, mm -hmm. If if uh, they've looked into that on on the static pressure that it adds, uh, these pads that increases the energy consumption of the fans? You know, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question without going into, into great detail. Um, I do know that what really surprised me was that a pad itself, uh, when a pad is wet, there's actually less static pressure through it than when it's dry. Um, I know the, the pads are they're sized, uh, the thing is, is sized and the motors are sized, um, I mean, if you think about it, it's going through a micro-channel condenser, which is probably 25% as thick as the typical tube and fin. Um, so I think it's that much different than if going through a uh, typical standard tube and fin condenser. Uh, I probably haven't answered the question, uh, but that's as well as I could answer that question without going into great detail. Uh, does does anyone else want to want to give it a shot or uh, add something to that? This is Steve. I missed the question. What was it? Could you repeat the question, Damon? Uh, sure, certainly. Um, well, the operative pads that are added to the micro channel condenser they'll add uh, static pressure to the fans. So fans will have to be or larger fans. Uh, or consume energy to the air across the pad. And uh, I've seen um, some like awnings and, and other methods of, uh, of, of lowering the temperature of the air where spraying water at, at them. But uh, I was just uh, curious if, if that is something that, that's really looked into uh, with, the, with the hybrid technology uh, on the pads. I don't have the data, but I'm sure Paul can get it because certainly whenever you restrict air, you, you create a little bit of static pressure, um, and there's and there's some static pressure. Uh, I've looked at a lot of other technologies out there, you know, that spray water in front of the coil, but what you happen, what you end up getting is a mist that, that ends up corroding the coil. It's a little bit a little bit different. Um, I think Paul did mention that 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 it's kind of unique, and they do have the data. To the support is that when the water does turn on, uh, the, so the pad is actually reduced because the water fills the, the pores of the pad, and and it and it it's uh, and the static pressure actually reduced when the water is running. So, because that was my first concern is that when the water was running, that you'd have a much higher static pressure. Uh, I think the technology of the motors they're using. Um, if you get the details on them, it's a pretty incredible uh, smart motor. The impact of the static is much smaller than it would have been on old motor technology. So they can get you the bit that certainly something's there, but I don't think it's significant enough to be a concern. So did uh, did that help answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? We we have uh, plenty of time. 
else. <clears throat> okay, I'm, uh, I'm not seeing any else. Um, so I'll kind of do my my standard uh, going going twice. Uh, Derek, go ahead. Derek, you have to press pound six. Hear me? Yes, I hear you. Go yeah. ahead. I'm, I'm Derek. I'm with Mueller. I actually just pulled up the technical chart on that pressure drop. Cross the uh, head was uh, 0.4 pay. The coil is double that. Oh, actually, it's 40 PA and 50 PA. So the pressure drop across the pad is less than the pressure cross pressure drop across the uh, micro channel coil. Okay. Thanks, Derek. Just a little. So it's it's maybe uh, 50 percent less. Okay. Consistency, and it looks like it's consistent against the one fan, two fan, three fans. So. Uh, but it's just a little less. Well, thank you. Um, thanks for adding that on. Buddy, any else? If if not, um, I'm I'm sure no one will um, be upset for us to end before 3:30, and and that you'll have 15 minutes extra time today. So if nobody else has any questions. Um, um, we'll go ahead and call it. And uh, what I'd certainly like to do again is thank all of our speakers. Um, I think everybody did a, a really good job. Um, thank you for volunteering. And um, thank you for for putting your expertise uh, on this subject at the disposal of Green Chill. We appreciate your cooperation. And uh, thanks to everyone who attended. Um, I appreciate it. If you have any feedback to give me, feel free to send me an email. And if there's anybody out there that received the invitation for this webinar um, because someone else forwarded it to you, um, feel free to just send me an email with any and all names that you'd like to have added on to the uh, Green Jewel webinar invitation list. We do at least one webinar a month. And um, I have a very large invitation list of people who, who want to receive all of the invitations. I'm, I'm happy to add anyone else onto that. So thanks very much again, and uh, have a good rest of the day, everybody. We'll, uh, we'll sign off now. Bye-bye. <laughs>